So for folks who have joined us, welcome. We are experiencing some new technical uh, intricacies, intricacies here that we have not had to do before because this is the first time we've tried to do a town hall with interpretation. If you are on with us, you will see at the bottom of your screen, a globe that says interpretation. And I'm going to ask everybody right now to click on English so we can all hear each other. Please click on English on the interpretation site where the globe is. And then Nora or Francisco, do you mind putting that in the chat or the, where everyone can see that? Thank you. Francisco, maybe before everyone switches over, you could make a quick announcement in Spanish that that's what people should do if they want to participate in Spanish before they switch over. Os, uh, si eh, estamos ofreciendo interpretación eh, para poder gozar de este beneficio, se si hacen el favor de pulsar el globito en la parte inferior derecha de su pantalla y escojan el idioma de su preferencia. If you are one of our participants, anybody, if you wouldn't mind clicking in the Q&A and acknowledge that you can hear us and that now you can hear us that you've clicked on English. I would really appreciate it because I can't see anybody. Thank you so much. Can you, and you, okay, thank hey, you. All right. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, welcome everybody and thank you for your patience. I am going to introduce Nora and Francisco, Francisco our interpreters tonight. And if you require Spanish interpretation, they're going to give you some instructions on how to do that. So hopefully, Francisco, you're on the English button right now where everyone can hear. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Francisco Picado. I'm from Language Access LLC. And um, this uh, meeting is being interpreted uh, into Spanish and vice versa. Uh, and to take advantage of that, uh, uh, you can click on the, on the globe on the bottom right of your screen and uh, pick the language of your choice. Um, para aquellos que eh, están interesados en escuchar esta reunión en español, uh, es, es, estamos ofreciendo este servicio y por favor pulse el lobito en la mano, eh, perdón, al lado derecho, uh, en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de su preferencia. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you for your patience as we work our way through this. So appreciative. Welcome this evening. Um, I'm Karen McGowan. I am one of the energy and carbon management commissioners and commissioner cross is also here with us tonight. And we have some ECMC staff and our interpreters and um, our consultants who are helping us put on these um, disproportionately impacted community town hall meetings. We have had four in-person meetings and based on some feedback from those in-person meetings, there was a request for us to do a virtual town hall. And so that's why we're here tonight. And I understand that there has been some concern about the short notice for this meeting. And I would like to clarify that it was short notice because we were planning on just doing the in-person meetings in various locations around Colorado. And after the first two meetings, we had a request to do a virtual meeting because some folks could not join us. And so I know that it feels short notice and I apologize for that, but we're trying to address some feedback we heard at our community meetings. And that's why it feels like there was short notice. In addition to that, I would like to point out that we've been having a conversation about cumulative impacts and oil and gas since January of this year, starting with listening sessions, then we had an informal written docket that anybody was allowed to participate in, then an informal public information docket where people spoke to the commission. And then we've had four community meetings. And this is, this is the culmination of all that work. This is our last meeting via town hall. I 
I would like to express some concern based on, I've heard that a mass email went out to some people asking folks to express their concern about the timing of this meeting. And I'm worried that if we spend all of our evening, I'm trying to be delicate about how I say this, so I apologize. If we spend all of our evening talking about how this meeting was last minute and people don't feel included, I'm worried that that will come at the expense of the folks who asked for this meeting and took time out of their day to, to participate and really have feedback for us about our cumulative impacts rulemaking. So that being said, I hear you. I acknowledge that this was short notice and I'm trying to explain why it was short notice. And I'm hoping that you all will give us some space and grace and that you will help us make this a meaningful town hall meeting where you can give feedback to this commission about what you would like to see as we try to define what cumulative impact means, what it means for a disproportionately impacted community that has been impacted by oil and gas development. And we really are looking forward to your feedback. All of the information that we are gathering from the in-person town hall meetings and this virtual meeting will be packaged together by Commissioner Cross and I, and we will be giving a presentation to the commission on January 10th to talk about the feedback we got from the in-person and the virtual meetings. And we're hoping that many of these ideas will be folded into our draft rules and considered by the whole commission. So with that, I think the way that we are doing this, we are trying to figure out the best way to do it. And uh, Commissioner Cross helped me. I think what we're gonna ask people to raise their hands and if they would like to speak, to go ahead and speak. I see 65 people on our town hall and so I'm not, I don't have a timer. I don't want to have a timer. Our in-person town hall meetings have been very conversational. I'm hoping that we can do that. So as you raise your hands, I'm not sure who, who is responsible for helping me. Pull I'll be someone. calling them up. Okay. So Roger, if you raise your hand, he's going to go in order. We're going to pull you up. I hope that you will show us your face. We want to see you. We want to have a conversation with you. And I hope you will share your ideas with us. Um, we're interested in hearing about your lived experience. We're interested in hearing about what you think needs to be considered if oil and gas development is near or within a disproportionately impacted community. And we're interested in hearing about what things you think need to be considered as part of a cumulative impacts assessment. And with that, I'm going to zip it because I'm really looking forward to hearing from you all. Okay, Roger, let's let's test the drive this all thing. Right, here we go. Let's uh, have Kelsey B come on first. If you'll unmute. Can you all hear me? We can. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity tonight to share my lived experience as a disproportionately impacted resident living um, in Erie. I moved to my home in Erie in 2020, and I was clueless about the threats that lay all around us um, inside the borders of Erie's town. Um, there are more than 300 oil and gas wells, and uh, a short six months after moving in to our new home, 24 horizontal wells were fracked in three mega pads just 3,000 feet north of my home. Uh, Commissioner McGowan, I was actually able to meet with you in person at these sites. I think it was the winter of 2021. Um, so basically, the, the impacts don't end even after the sound, light, and odors fade into the background after initial fracking and flowback. I've seen firsthand how truck traffic ruins our roads, pollutes our air, and adds to the existing traffic problem in Erie. And these activities cause night and uh, noise and light pollution at all hours of the day. And these wells emit harmful BTEX chemicals, even um, you know, long after 
those initial phases. Uh, the There's leaks from wellheads and pipelines all the time in Erie. And um, in many cases, these are even after wells have been plugged and abandoned for several decades. At my kid's school, the, all of these state wells had to be um, re <laughs> reopened after they were plugged and abandoned for, I think it was five or six years because there was a major methane leak. Um, it was terrifying to think that that was just 500 feet from my kid's school. Um, we continue to receive emails from the town of Erie about legacy leaks, which impact not only our soil and nearby waterways, but the residents nearby. Um, just two weeks ago, I think it was, there was a leak that, um, you know, they went in to plug and abandon uh, a well site for a uh, new development in the town. And they found this thing's been leaking for how <laughs> they don't even know. And it's leaked 20 feet down in the soil. Um, and then the health impacts from nearby wells, you know, there's a a correlation now in our research that shows childhood leukemia is linked to living near oil and gas wells. Um, you know, neighbors experience migraines and nosebleeds, asthma attacks. Uh, I myself live with primary immunodeficiency, and I worry about what these endocrine disruptors and toxic chemicals are going to do to my body. I had the air tested on my driveway in the summer of 2022, and there were BTEX chemicals present in the sample. Um, these wells are just hazardous to our health and the risks aren't worth it. So in the past five years alone, the resident growth has exploded in Erie, which is why it's so important to give, you know, more legs to this SB 19-181. Um, one idea I have is that, you know, the town of Erie doesn't have a FLIR camera of its own and there's not enough, um, you know, people to monitor these well sites that Erie uh, needs its own camera to go around and look for these methane leaks, look for, you know, soil changes. Uh, these wells are just leaking for far too long before um, they're detected, you know, and it's often that they leak for years and it's not till they're plugged that we discover these. Um, the wells aren't in the middle of nowhere anymore. Um, they're in the middle of little developed communities. So um, I just thank you so much for this work. And I just beg you to please, you know, maintain the commitment to put resident health and safety first by bolstering this legislation around cumulative impacts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelsey. And thank you for sharing your idea. And uh, thanks for hopping in because I know we saw you in Erie too. So I know you're spending a lot of time of your own. So I appreciate it. Um, Roger, who do we have next? Next up is uh, Leslie. Uh, Leslie, go ahead. Hi, Leslie. Hi, uh, Leslie Glustrom here. I don't think I see a way to turn my camera on. I don't know if why. There is. Um, I'll just wait and see. But um, join as a panelist. Let me see. There you go. You should be able to turn on your camera now. There you are. Okay, we can't hear you. You may have to, uh, Leslie, select English again. I can well, hear you. Looks like you're, on mute. you're muted. I can hear Leslie. I want to ask you to move forward with as much courage and honesty as possible. Um, I'll just start with the fact that we already have a federal definition of cumulative impacts. That's quite good. And we have a state definition of cumulative impacts from the hydrogen bill. That's quite good. And I think anything that doesn't use that as a foundation for the definition of cumulative impacts and for helping us get a handle on these tens of thousands of wells that are adding to the pollution that's making so many people, including myself, 
very sick. Um, I'm trained as a chemist and a biochemist for Commissioner McGowan. I trained at University of Wisconsin Madison back many decades ago, uh, before they knew that that students shouldn't sit with be beakers of benzene and toluene and xylene, you know, 150, 200 mils, everybody having all of that sitting on their bench in front of them and all 30 of us doing it. And I would walk out of those labs thinking I was going to keel over. So I have developed a very severe sensitivity to volatile organic compounds. Um, I spend most of my time over at the Public Utilities Commission um, as an intervener. Um, I resigned my job in 2004 to work full time on climate change. What isn't widely known is that I have this severe chemical sensitivity, which makes my life very, very difficult. I show up time and again, and I look and act normal or somewhat normal, but I have to really, really struggle. And the doctor's like, oh yeah, you just have a constant migraine. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna call it that, but I do. My pain level is very, very high. I live in Boulder, so I'm technically not in a disproportionately impacted community, but of course I'm right next door and the atmosphere likes to come over our way and hang out our way. So. I do live in a disproportionately impacted body and most importantly, a disproportionately impacted brain. I have severe headaches all the time. I wake up in the morning as though I've been drinking all night long and I've never actually been drunk in my life, but I sure that's what I feel like. My eyes burn, my throat burn, my stomach, I'm nauseous. And I think I can't get through this day. And if you all were over at the Public Utilities Commission, you'd just be shaking your head because I've been over there, you know, working on cleaning up our electricity for many, many years now. You can search me, pages and pages and pages of stuff. So I do function, but I function against, frankly, all odds. So I appreciate your time very much. And I would just ask, start with that federal definition, start with the state definition and work from there. Please don't just create some cockamamie thing that doesn't give the commission any power over these thousands. Did I just looked at the Boulder Reservoir modeling result? You know, air monitoring results on Boulder Air's website, and you know, we had a benzene spike today, and it wasn't probably above limits, but it was a significant spike, and I kind of know all that because I'm blessed miserable all blessed day long. Um, and so I go up high a fair bit because I can feel better once I get above the air. But every time I come down, you see the air. I did it last night coming off Flagstaff Mountain. You can see the air. You're not supposed to be able to see the air. So we know we know it quantitative, we know it qualitatively. We are, we are failing everyone in Colorado that is living with this air and the ECMC has a profound obligation to take the cumulative impact laws seriously. And again, I wanna thank you all for your time and I wanna wish you the best courage you can possibly bring as you draft these rules and thank you for your time. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks for sharing that idea. I know a lot of folks have been talking about the, what the definition looks like and uh, various folks who've or, already thought about this. So I appreciate your input, we all do. Thank Rod you. Who we have next? All right, sorry, I really, I really don't want to put the timer on. I really want this to feel like more of a conversation in town hall. But if we could, if folks could try to respect the fact that we've got seventy-one people, oh, I see seventy-one participants. I want to give everyone a chance who wants to speak up tonight the ability to do so. So, brevity. What's the saying? Brevity is the friend of somebody. So, thank you. All right, I think uh, Lucy is next. And um, Lucy, I'm going to change you to panelist. And you'll be able to turn on your camera and uh, join us. Just have to unmute. Yes, we can hear you. if you can see me but uh when i start this uh good evening uh thank you so much oh language interpretation do i need to do anything there with the language no you're good okay 
All right. Um, I, I'm just going to piggyback a little bit on what Ms. Leslie, our, our previous uh, speaker, uh, about adopting the federal government's standard already that is already in place. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and and I, just a reminder that um, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, there is a climate crisis that we're facing. Um, Lucy Molina from Commerce City, uh, we're at a place where we have no drinking water. Our air and our land is contaminated. I've been, uh, I've got the, I guess, privilege of uh, testifying before uh, these entities before. Um, and, you know, it's, it's uh, burdened my heart a little bit that I'm continually here uh, showing up for the same reasons. I do appreciate the platform uh, and to be included. Um, but, uh, you know, the asthma, the leukemia, the cancers, uh, those, when we talk about cumulative impacts, the things that we have been dealing with for decades here in Commerce City, particularly in uh, in an area where I live next to the oil refinery right here, right? This Colorado's oil, oil refinery. And I would like to remind the commission also that uh, more fracking means more refining. So where is that crop going to be refined at? Next to my house is what's going to happen, which means to me additional more cancers, more leukemia, more asthmas, more migraines, more uh, bloody noses, which is a norm. And I wanted to uh, add right now, I had a, a really pleasant visit from a, a state representative earlier uh, today to my house. And it was, you know, we were outside talking from my, at my uh, in my yard for a while. And it was, uh, he got to experience firsthand. Uh, we were shouting outside and he, we were enjoying the beautiful sunset. And uh, he's like, you know, my head hurts. And I, I tell him, you smell that, you smell that? I go, that's a normal for us. So this is normal for us. We have been complacent. We have, uh, because of government decisions, this community has become complacent. Uh, I would again uh, add about um, adopting the federal standards that are already in place. Uh, and, you know, we're still here. We're still here uh, in Commerce City. We have been fighting, uh, protecting even our education uh, as we've been targeted as one of the lowest performing districts in the state. But we are also one of the highest uh, COVID, asthma, and cancer uh, areas of the state of Colorado. Um, so those are some of, I'm talking about my personal uh, impacts as well. Uh, with the migraines, with the bloody noses, and particularly the impacts that has caused to my children's education. Okay, missing school days, truancy, uh, missing days of school. Roads and the transportation issues, but you know, it, it impacts our life enti in entirely. Um, I have a much to say. I am gonna, uh, you know, pass it over to the next person. Uh, again, I appreciate this. Uh, opportunity to speak, and um, I hope that the community can be a bigger part of these decisions for the state of Colorado had, that has done hasn't done much the last few years. Uh, we have to get real because we are facing a climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Molina. Is it Councilmember Molina? She left. Go on. But All thank right. you. Roger, who's next? Next up is uh, Dr. Morales. I'll promote you to, and please turn on your camera if you can. You should be able to... Uh, Doctor, if you could unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? There we go. Thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, sorry about that. So I'm Dr. Anarelli Morales. I'm the air quality policy analyst for Weld County. Um, I'm the stuff I'm gonna mention right now is not it, this is my own personal thoughts. Um just to consider um, truck traffic, 
or, or just the, the trucks that um, go in and out of the facilities. Um, so impacts to traffic, impacts to um, roads. So if there are any um, uh, impacts or detriment to the roads, who will pay for those repairs? Um, the county here has to pay for a lot of repairs for roads. Um, so if there's additional um, heavy equipment that's being dr driven on those, um, who's going to pay for that? Um, let's see, clear signs um, at the sites as to who to call if you see X, Y, Z. So um, I hear a lot of people um, talking about flares and it's unclear whether they're allowed or not allowed or what if, what does a flare look like? Um, so maybe clear images on the signs as to uh, if you see this, this is bad, call this number because that's not allowed. Um, there's a lot of terms that are used that are not what people think they mean. Um, so that's really important um, and have yeah a phone number uh, to call and someone to call them back. Um, clear communication of risk and exposure and dose. Um, so I don't know if that's more of a educational campaign or another thing to be on one of those signs near the facilities of um, this is exposure and dose and uh, talking about spikes of benzene, understanding the thresholds that are for acute or chronic exposure, um, that kind of information, I feel like just in general, we need to improve um, understanding of toxicity. Um, and then um, the proximity to water, um, specifically rivers, and um, who's using the water, um, are the facilities touching that water at all, if they're not supposed to or they shouldn't. Um, so what, where's the water being used? Where's the water being deposited? Um, it's things that are probably already being looked into, but just run off of water um, when it rains, et cetera, depending on where you are, um, depending on the weather um, or the climatology of that area. And then uh, health-wise, assessing um, the current and, I guess, historical health of residents, because that happens a lot, or at least that I've seen, where um, people will say that there's a, or there's, some health impacts being observed um, post facility being implemented, but there is no, there's not as much um, analysis or deep dive as to what was the health prior to that um, to really assess the impact of a facility to the health of the people nearby. Um, yeah, I'm sure I could give more. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the multiple ideas. I think Sabrina is taking notes for us. So we have a lot to go through here. Who's next, Roger? It must be Carol because I can't hear Roger. And so Carol, welcome. That's Hello? Easy, Carol. I should unmute myself. Carol, you are on and you should be able to turn on your camera. Okay, I'm not experienced with Zooms, so I'll do my best. If I can't, you're just, can you hear me? We can hear you, Carol. And if you click on the stop video, there's a little red line through it. If you click on it, then we should be able to see you. Oh, okay. Well, there's your ceiling, maybe. Oh, let's try this. There you are. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Carol Hawkins. I live in Alt, Colorado. I moved here in late 2017 after living for 25 years in the beautiful clean air of Maine. My family uh, has been in Colorado since the early 70s, maybe a little before that. My youngest daughter was born here. I went to New England for graduate work and had a life there until my partner passed away. So I moved back here to be closer to my family of origin here. And um, I was a full-time caregiver. My partner had Alzheimer's. So I had to look for a place to live online. I quickly learned, um, couldn't afford to live where I wanted to live, which is in Fort Collins. 
Um, so the map said Alt was only 14 miles east of Fort Collins. And I found a beautiful little bungalow, put my life savings into it. Sight unseen. My daughter did come and look at it. I have a daughter here and grandchildren here, great grandchildren. And moved. Um, I'm very happy with my bungalow. I like the little town of Alt, and it is convenient to Fort Collins. But I was very quickly served with a forced pooling notice, which made me dive into activism. What the heck is this? So I've been involved in protesting before the COGCC. Now, I guess it's the ECMC. I testified. I was given two minutes or three, maybe three. I felt dismissed and not heard. I heard Mr. Robbins say after uh, my two minutes were up or three minutes, well, she didn't address the permits. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a chemist. I'm a retired English professor who couldn't afford to live in Fort Collins. I live in a low income community that is disproportionately impacted. Since moving here, um, I've started, not only have I been um, bombarded by uh, wells as everybody in our community, but I have suffered nosebleeds, a nasal infection. I developed lung nodules. I had an MRI before I moved here. I didn't have lung nodules. Now I have lung nodules. High blood pressure, sleep apnea, migraines, migraines, lots of migraines. So I have suffered the health impacts, but what really breaks my heart is what's happened to Colorado in the 25 years I've been gone. Fracking has become normalized. And I find it dystopian. Um, a lot of people live in all because we can't afford to live in little town in cities like Fort Collins. So we are a low income community that is disproportionately impacted, definitely. Um, I see what's happened on our roads. I consider Route 14 between Alt and Fort Collins. Um, um, significant of everything that's wrong with Colorado. Fracking, landfill, overdevelopment, two-lane highway that is now trying to absorb massive amounts of traffic. Um, I uh, see the same drillers applying for permits around Alt. I'm going to mention one, Bayswater. That's the permit. I protested, and when I was dismissed and not heard because I wanted to talk about health impacts, I listened to Bayswater tell the commission about all their best practices. Well, as soon as they started drilling, I got earthworks out there with their magic camera, and we started filing complaints about the major emission events that were happening at Bayswater. I have been dubbed the mother of all major emission events, not a title I'm enjoying. So yeah, I'm, I'm an angry citizen. I'm a scared citizen. I'm a sick citizen. But I think what's really breaking my heart is when I see wells go up within 500 feet of Highland School and I start at the county level and I try to complain and they tell me it's a grandfathered permit. And then I see PDC, you know, when they I got that forced pooling notice, I protested. They withdrew their permit, but they just moved south of town and they're horizontally drilling under our town. So we got horizontal drilling from the south, from the east. We got plenty of wells west and the landfill. But I wanna go back to Bayswater because I think one of the things this commission has to start considering are dirty operators. I think they all are, to be honest with you. I don't think there is any such thing as a safe well pad. They all lead commissions. I don't think you should be issuing any permits in a non-attainment zone. Call me crazy, but I'm just gonna say the B word. We need to ban fracking until we get our air quality under control. 
And when I see these dirty operators, I hear I hear Bayswater's just filed for another permit. God help us if they come. To, where else can they drill? Where else can they drill in Alt? I I was told. I asked someone, "How many wells do we have now?" And they said they lost count. So we have to consider how many wells you're putting in these very small areas, you know, impacting these poor and these towns that are already are marginalized. We have to consider health impacts. My grandson bought a house here because he couldn't, he also couldn't afford a house in Fort Collins. Starting a little family of his own, just right on the other side of town, which isn't very far. They just had a baby. That baby came early. That baby came with a low birth weight. That baby is still trying to catch up. That baby lives probably within a mile of that PDC, PDC well that's right behind the Highland School. The Highland School is surrounded by wells. So yeah, I'm an angry citizen. I see, I think it's dystopian the way we're living in Colorado. I can't believe this is what's happened to this state. When you go away and you come back after 25 years, it's really quite shocking. So. I, I will say, I will try to be polite and say thank you for giving me a voice where I didn't have one before. And I really appreciate the opportunity to use my voice. And I hope you will consider the testimonies of average citizens like me who are suffering from health, health impacts because I can't speak to the technology. And to be honest with you, I don't want to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hawkins. All right, next up is uh, Cherie. I'm sure I misspelled, mispronounced your name. We'll promote you and you can join us as a panelist. There she is. Okay, so I think if you click your uh, the mute button, then we might be able to hear you. And I'm going to say Ms. Walker. Can you see the, there you go. Yes. And if you want to, to show us your face or be with us, you can click also on the stop video. You don't have to, but we hopefully. Can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Can. can you hear us? Ah, okay. I heard that um, name <laughs> um, is um, Dr. Cherie walker Revenue. And, and, and it's shivery. My mom gave me that name. So, um, so I am the executive director of Black Parents United Foundation and Brown Parents United Foundation. In part, I had to turn my video off because I had to pick up my kids who were asleep in the car, but I wanted to stay connected with you guys here. Uh, so I, I, I've i enjoyed hearing uh, the because I think we all have the same voice, um, even with Lucy, um, even with Karen, uh, the speaker that was before me, uh, I, I I would like to say even just listening to this conversation, BPUF is on Colfax and Dayton in the ACAD area on Colfax and Dayton, zip code 80010 out in Aurora. I live in Aurora. Um, I've lived in 80010, 80011, 80012, and 80013. Um, and we're trying to buy a house. Uh, more south of Aurora, um, and that's more of 80018. My, my concern here is just mul multiple issues when we think about cumulative impacts. Um, my, my issue is that I got a little girl right now in the car with me that is sleeping, and she's fighting asthma. She's fighting for her life. And we didn't have this issue. I, mind you, I was born and raised uh, in Mississippi, but my daughter uh, was almost 14. We've been here since. And she had her first asthma attack when she was three here. So she's been here since she was a baby. So I, I, um, I've been here for a long time. No one in our family has asthma. No one. And I didn't even know what was happening to her. And we were in 80010 at the time. Um, the, the scariest part is seeing your child gasp for air and you don't know that your child is dying. She's on the floor. 
and she's three years old at the time. I rushed into Children's Hospital, and they said she had respiratory airway disease. At that time, they said they couldn't diagnose her with asthma um, because she was too young. I think they properly diagnosed her maybe a year or two later. Um, and I don't know what's up with that, but that's what they told me at the time. Um, they called it RAD, and they did the same treatment as if she was an asthma patient. She was, she stayed overnight. She had to breathe the machines. They had to get her breathing back under control. And this little girl was having an asthma attack for almost six hours. And I had no idea. Um, one of these, one of the things that I want to talk about is um, the, the fracking. We, we have to understand those of us that are on this call, the value of health and the value of life. People are getting, people are sick. People have gotten sick and people will continue to get sick and die because it's it's everywhere. And here's my reason why for saying that, not just because of my daughter, but all the stories and testimonies that people are seeing tonight, there's, there's plethora of people that could be on this call and we'll be here forever to hear all these different stories. And we have to understand the value of life over value of dollar. And I, I personally know that um, if we do not follow the federal standard or what whatever is being followed, we can you can't you can't make that up. Um, and we can't bring that you can't make it up because no one's at the table to help you um, develop this type of standard. So we have to use the standard that is already in place. If no one there that is um, Helping with the standard is not a part of the disproportionately impacted community and can be a testimony of what this standard says. We should not uh, recreate anything. We should use the standard that is already there. I know um, fracking has become a norm here in Colorado. It's everywhere. And I had no idea. I had I had no idea. I, I saw the news last month about fracking is happening over in 80018 and mind you these people are not poor people these people are um they have a higher income and they're being fracked too um it's almost to a point to where you don't care you don't care who it is now and i and i that that's concerning because we the, the fracking is happening so much to where it's the norm you don't care where you're put you're fracking at you're just gonna frack and that's concerning for me because, again, we're not valuing people's health or their lives or their children's lives. No one is coming to my door. No one has ever offered to give me $400, $500 a month for my daughter's steroid that she takes every day. And it's a hit or miss if the insurance will cover it. And I know for sure, for me, um, it's, it's, a, it's a wear and tear on community members such as myself. And I'm speaking not just as an ED, I'm speaking because I live in it. And I feel like the best people to speak about this issue are the ones that are going through the trenches of it, not those who are making the decisions. I appreciate the decision being made, but I also appreciate more that you guys are uh, allowing this listening session for people to express their concerns around the oil and gas. It's almost, it's disgusting to me uh, when I see uh, so many people that are getting sick, so many loss of lives. How many funerals are we going to continue to have? How many kids are continue to get sick? No one is giving anybody any compensation for all the doctor visits um, that parents have to go to and kids like both and most of most of the people that are being hit with the fragging in the oil and gas industry are people that don't have a high income. And in it's it's tragic. So right now I'm on. 270 right now, about to get on 70, and I'm about to start smelling poop. That's what I'm about to start smelling because I'm about to go through Commerce City where Lucy is right now, and that's what I'm about to get hit with. It's 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 a shame that we that we live like this. And I just heard the former speaker that just said that she came back after 25 years to see that the state is in the condition that it's in. It's heartbreaking to see that. So what I'm asking um that the federal standard and the federal guidelines to be adhered to and not reinvent the wheel and just understand and just truly listen, not just because we're here at six to eight, but just take the time to continue to listen. I've heard that you guys have had these meetings since January and it was stated this was the culmination of um, the listening session. Um, and I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak um, as a representative of the black community and the representative of the brown community and 
communities of color in general. Um, I stay, I stand here and speak because I, I want to speak for those who are not able to speak tonight and those who may not have a voice and those who have passed away that should have had a voice. So if we can uh, continue to focus on keeping the federal standard, not not try to develop a new one um, and just keep the community in mind, keep the community in your back pocket, keep the community at the table, give the community a voice. And then I think we can make better progress if we can unify whether than rather it being a handful of people making a decision. So again, thank you for your time. I really do appreciate um, the listening session tonight. And I'm hoping that we continue to continue to have this conversation even more, especially going into 2024 um, because I have, you know, trying to buy a house and I'm texting the manager over there out right, right near Watkins in Arapahoe County, literally four minutes away from where the fracking wells are because there's a trailer park over there. I get a text message saying I wouldn't worry about the fracking. It's pretty common. So desensitized, so desensitized to the oil and gas industry to where people want to continue to live their lives. But I'm going to tell you what I got. I got two girls and one on the way. I got a a baby right now that I'm carrying and I will not allow this on my watch and I will do what I can to help you guys make any decision that is going to help our community, strengthen our community and give them a voice because we haven't had one in so long. And I, I do think that is it is time to stop stop playing and make the right decision and follow follow the federal standards so everyone can be in accord and we can be unified. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker, and uh, thank you for taking time tonight and drive safely because it sounds like maybe you're still in the car. Um, and then for folks, for folks who have been um, testifying and talking about the federal standard, it would be maybe really helpful, maybe in the chat or if you're still um, going to testify, um, federal standard seems a little broad to me. There was some suggestions during our written um, informal docket and uh, public, but they were kind of specific as to where you to find the definition. And Commissioner Cross, maybe you remember more than I do. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding what folks mean by the federal definition. So if you have more information about that that you want to share and um, put it in the comments if you want, or if you're still waiting to testify or share your story with us, then um please do help fill us in and we'll, we'll, then we can take better notes and, and hone in on that. And then I also wanted to remind folks that if you want to speak, there's a raise your, there's like a raise your hand icon. And for me, it's under the more three dots, it says more. And then if you click on that, you can see raise hand. Um, so just want to remind folks if you don't know how to do it, because even though I've been Zoom for a long time, I still struggle to figure out where that raise hand mm -hmm. button is. Okay, thank right. you so much. Roger, who do we have next? Bobby is next. Go ahead, Bobby. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Great. Well, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Bobby Mooney, an organizer with 350 Colorado. And I want to say thanks for the opportunity and thanks for acknowledging earlier the short notice because um, it was short notice for both the in-person session, in -person sessions and this virtual session. And, you know, you just have to think about the message that, that that sends to communities when you leave these sessions, the DIC sessions as, as sort of the last thing, right? The last opportunity of the year and announced with short notice and held during and close to the December holidays. So it, and even if that's not the intention, it can seem like once again, DICs are, are given the last thought here. And this virtual session didn't, um, didn't wasn't on the plans until until it was asked for during the in-person sessions is it, kind of surprising to me. Um, I shouldn't that that seems like something that could have been thought of earlier and advertised earlier. So uh, um, we're asking you to think a little further ahead, do a little better in communicating to DICs and and recognizing what it takes for community members to show up and tell a state agency yet again how this industry is impacting their health and their lives and their children. As you know, groups like um, some of those that are here tonight and 350 Colorado have together been urging this commission to address cumulative impacts of oil and gas development for years. And, and now it's, you know, we're years, four years past 181 and our air quality has not improved. The ECMC has permitted many, many thousands of new production facilities since 
um, passage of SB 19181 without addressing their cumulative impacts. So, so we are hopeful about this upcoming rulemaking, right? We're expectant and we urge you to adopt meaningful rules that will protect DICs and all Coloradans. So we urge that the definition of cumulative impacts must include cumulative impacts of oil and gas development when added to the impacts of other past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future development of any type in the relevant area. Otherwise, we're not actually talking about cumulative impacts, not really. And this rulemaking won't amount to any meaningful change for the DICs you've asked to spend their time with you this month during the busy holiday season and on short notice. So do all that you can to adopt meaningful rules that will protect us. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for that specificity too. That's helpful. Um, and so I just want to fill in a little more information. It, it, it is terrible to be doing meetings during the holidays. Uh, I absolutely agree. We have to have the rulemaking done by the end of April per legislation. And that means we have to have draft rules to submit to the secretary of state's office and for people to have time to read the rules and respond to the draft rules and then give us their feedback again and get that all done by April. So again, I am going to acknowledge that this is not perfect. Um, and I, I would much rather be at a cookie exchange tonight or a, you know, whatever. I We are really committed and wanting to hear from you. And I appreciate everyone taking their time out tonight to do so. All right, Tom is next. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, Tom. Tom, I cannot hear you if you're talking. Uh, Tom McCracken. There you go. Great. Thank you. My name is Tom McCracken. I'm from Chafee County. Chafee County is a couple of passes away from the Front Range, south of uh, Leadville, south of uh, Aspen, um, in uh, uh, a pretty rural, uh, pretty rural Colorado. And I've been in the valley and associated with the valley since 72, and I've seen quite a few changes recently. I know Colorado Energy has now taken not jurisdiction, but regulatory powers over deep water geothermal wells. Uh, these are wells that are not the typical residential wells of two, three, four hundred feet, but um, 10 times that, three, four, 5,000 feet deep. And so we have a little bit of a, 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 a feel of uh, our possible disproportionate impact here since any energy that would be created there would be shipped probably out of the valley since our local Sangre de Cristo has already uh, uh, garnered enough energy for for their quota per, uh, per the uh, carbon tax uh, numbers through the inflation. Reduction Act, and so I guess my comment or my thought is: is this exit strategy of of a, of a firm that puts in a geothermal uh, well, spike well, seven, eight thousand feet deep, and finds that it doesn't supply enough, and then uh, I'm just concerned about the exit strategy: and do they abandon the well? Do they leave the well? And do they, uh, or do they try to expand the well and drill more? And and remind you of the drill baby drill era. Uh, from a few decades ago, and, and we're we're trying to avoid that kind of uh, impact. Literally, I, I am uh, one mile from one of the nearest, uh, one of the most recent proposals. So I'm not going to take up a lot of time. I just wanted to put that exit strategy thought uh, in your all's mind. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mr. McCracken. And I just wanted, um, Mimi, could you remind folks, I think there are some draft geothermal rules, and we want to make sure that folks know those are out there. And how to when we, what the timing is for folks to see them when they get posted and put out into the universe and how to participate? Sure. So we had straw dog geothermal rules that were released to the public in uh, October. And we received feedback from the commission on those straw dog rules in November. And with the feedback we received, staff has gone back and is in the course of uh, analyzing the rules and, and making some additional revisions to them. So we expect to be able to have some straw dog, revised straw dog rules for geothermal out in January. And then where Director Murphy announced at last week's hearing that we will be having a rulemaking on the geothermal rules in June or July. So right now, we're still in that initial rule drafting phase, 
but the ultimate goal is to have the rulemaking in June of July of 2024. I hope Mr. McCracken stayed with us. I was going to call Mr. Chafee because of Chafee County, but I hope uh, Mr. McCracken still with us and he heard that and I hope that he will participate in that process. Roger, who do we have next? All I right. feel like a talk show host. I like know. a letter that I turn or something. Next up is Haley. Go ahead. Haley, it looks like you just... Um, um, hey, sorry. Can you hear me? Sorry, join us. Analysts? Yes, there we you can hear you. Then we can see you. Now we can't hear you, Haley. Try clicking the, the mute button again so you we have you again. There you go. Okay. Sorry. I apologize. Um and I could let you see me. However, um I happen to at this very moment be driving. So um you safe. I don't know if I should yeah, we, admit that. we would prefer that you're safe. So Right. I almost I thought of fun raising my hand for the moment that I am, but nevertheless, I am um I'm an environmental engineer. Um I work for a lot of home builders and Arapahoe. County. I'm an engineer and a surveyor, and I've actually been writing a lot of pieces lately on ethics um, because I feel that, unfortunately, the burden of forward planning seems to be falling on, I, I don't know who it's falling on, frankly, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm really wondering why there are is even such a thing as grandfathered plans when it comes to fracking, because right now in Arapahoe County, we have a lot of citizens who have spoken up and there are around where they are building a lot of fracking wells. And we're talking about almost 200 wells that are planned and in progress right now. Um, and really all risking water resources. <laughs> and, you know, there's, there's so many homes that are planned all around these wells. And it's absolute insanity to me. I have home builders that are like, I mean, they don't know. They have no idea. The home builders have no idea, let alone their residents once they actually move in. And then we as citizens that do know in Arapahoe County worked very hard for increasing the setbacks for fracking, but somehow they're still able to get in new permits um, for, you know, because you, they're considering it an expansion of wells. I mean, it, it seems crazy. It seems crazy to me, too, that the state would vote to approve gas burning, new gas burning plants. I mean, didn't we already realize that making new infrastructure, new plants is a mistake with the Pueblo plant built in 2009. I think that, you know, I'm a coal burning plant in 2009. I mean, I am just wondering what we expect for future generations for water and air. I, I mean, at the rate that this is going, we aren't even going to have a planet. We aren't going to have, we aren't going to have a civilization. Hopefully the planet will still be here, um, you know, but I, I feel like I've seen throughout my entire career, even when I was in school, I would ask the question, isn't fracking, <laughs> isn't it a, a risk for earthquakes? Isn't it a risk for our aquifers? And I was laughed at at the time, but now it's a proven fact that it's a seismic risk. risk. It's actually something that's shutting down a lot of fracking in Europe because of these billions of dollars that are, you know, these companies aren't going to pay for those risks. They're going to pay for the people they're killing. They're not going to pay for, I mean, and, and that is the reality. They are killing people. One in five deaths is directly associated with air pollution caused by fossil fuels. And I think at this point, you know, with all of the deaths caused by um, the heating in our atmosphere and it just, it has to stop. It has to stop. We don't need grandfathered plans. So I would say as far as my recommendation, I would really like to see the state um, allow counties to be able to reject expansions of wells, be able to say, hey, no, we 
we change the regulations. Also, I would really like to see utilization of um, communication sources that I know the state has. Um, just yesterday, my daughter actually received a text even for um, a survey for the state on um, what the 2030 fracking proposal um, would but the opinions that she had <laughs> um, and my daughter sent it to me since she's not old enough to vote. But um, I, I, would, I would like to see that system utilized for, hey, um, there's this proposal for new wells. I think at this point um, there is enough um, impact that is proven that it has on citizens that I think um, citizens as a whole um definitely have a right to know so thank you thank you Haley drive carefully um and I do think thank you we've had discussions too as commissioners to try to figure out how to let citizens know ahead of time when something might be impacting their community and I think it's uh, a very important conversation I know we all do Roger who's next Weston is joining as a panelist hi Mr. Wilson Okay, you made it up. there you go. There you go. All right. Can you see me now, Commissioner McCallan? So uh, we can hear you, but not see you. And okay. if that's your desire, that's okay, but we can hear you. How do I turn my camera on? Um, so you see where it says stop video? Okay, There's start a little red slash through it. If you click there on it, you there you go. Now we can see you. All right, thank you. Well, thanks for taking the time in the middle of the holidays to have this listening session. I appreciate it, Commissioner McGowan, that you're conducting it more like a, a town hall meeting rather than sh short little brief comments. Um, I'm Weston Wilson. I, I worked for 35 years for the Environmental Protection Agency. And all of that time, either reviewing or preparing environmental impact statements. And I was fortunate enough to under uh, prior administrations to go to Europe and teach the process of environmental evaluation. And of course, the key thing one does in that type of education is to define cumulative impacts. And I, I think what the prior speakers were talking to about using the federal standards is, is simply the definition of cumulative impacts under NEPA, which is past, present, and reasonably foreseeable future actions, regardless of what party is taking them. It, it's in that means that you could get to the cumulative effects of these toxic air emissions on this uh, directly impacted communities. Because they're certainly suffering, not just from the NOx and VOC coming from the industry, but for the NOx and VOCs from all other sources, particularly transportation or any other industrial source nearby. I, I you know, the, the, um, the definition of what the legislature has, has given, the task the commission has been given by the, by the legislature is, is incredibly simple, but complex to educate to undertake. And that is um, section D of HB 1294 requires the commission to evaluate and address the cumulative impacts and provide that definition. So the recommendation I, uh, you're hearing from many um, is to adopt a definition in NEPA of cumulative impacts because it is that means you take on the ability to first assess, evaluate, and later address the impacts that are coming from multiple sources, including the past and the future. The, there were several speakers tonight, uh, Lesbian and, and Lucy particularly um, emphasized that well, that they're of the view that oil and gas is affecting their health directly. The commission needs to be in a position to understand whether that's correct or not. 
And it, it needs to evaluate that. And there's certainly a lot of analysis that's already indicating that is correct. Especially the work done by Dr. Lisa McKenzie on birth weight, birth outcomes, including an increase in spina bifida for women proximate to oil and gas wells. And you have the entire compendium developed by uh, in New York of all the health studies associated with oil and gas fracking. When I, when I listened uh, several weeks ago, I was really kind of dumbfounded by Commissioner Cross is at how adamant he was that the commission would not adopt a NEPA process. And how he had a, such a narrow focus that the commission should only address impacts for which the commission could require change. That's not what it means by address. The obligation to the commission to address, it means that you've fully considered it and you've dealt with it. For example, if you dealt with these uh, cumulative health impacts from oil and gas, you can't simply say that the Air Pollution Control Division has taken appropriate action without your own analysis. And that if you concluded something more would be done, you would address that by involving the CDPHE in additional actions that would actually lead to your obligation under 181 to protect public health. Um, recently, uh, I'll tell you, McGowan, uh, or Commissioner McGowan, I read an interesting article from Western Area Power Authority uh, where they were saying how, how, uh, what a benefit it was for them to undertake a program, EIS, for their efforts to approve power lines from renewable energy sources. And, and what they found was that that streamlined their process when they were applying an environmental analysis to a specific project. I hear far too much discussion from the commission about how you would apply cumulative impacts to an operator for uh, an oil and gas development plan or comprehensive area plan. That is the next step, but the first step needs to be taken by the commission at using as cooperating agencies, these counties, the Colorado Health uh, Department of Health for sure, the Wildlife Division, the the, 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 part, the group that runs the energy office, and consider what the energy office has just told the state. Wilter's office has said in their way of addressing global impacts from fossil fuel burning is to expect a 30% increase in production in fracking in Colorado by 2030. Now, I think the commission is on a path to say, as long as we do that better, we've met our obligation. That's not sufficient, Commissioner McGowan. That's not sufficient to show that you've complied with one in one's obligation that the cumulative impacts of your activities are adequate to protect public health. You need to do that analysis of your program, and the recommendation is use the definition under NEPA of cumulative impacts. I thank you for your time. Please consider what I've had to say about how you would integrate your program into this rulemaking. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And um, I know you've got some expertise in EISs and NEPA processes. So thanks for sharing. Oh, and we lost him, but I wanted to ask him um, some of the feedback we've gotten in the in-person and from some of the written testimony is to have look at baseline, a baseline. I'm struggling with how we fold in past um, into a definition of cumulative impacts and what that would encompass and how that would happen just because that I'm not familiar with how that's done. But it's easier for me to understand like a baseline what's happening today. And so food for thought for folks. Um, I welcome feedback. You, my number and everything is on the website. And um, also as we're going through draft rulemaking. Welcome, Mr. 
sorry, Coleman. Coleman. Yes. Hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Hi. Very nice to meet you, Commissioner, and uh, all the other commissioner and the staff. It's, it's great to have this opportunity. Um, I'm Paul Coleman. Um, I'm a volunteer with Safe and Healthy Colorado, Safe and Healthy Colorado CO.org. And uh, we're working on a ballot initiative to phase out fracking. Um, but we're here tonight to talk about cumulative impacts. Um, just to kind of go off of what the last speaker was saying, um, cumulative impacts are um, when seemingly insignificant exposures to pollution can add up. They add up over time, as he said, past, present, future. Uh, they accumulate from multiple sources. They accumulate from multiple types of sources. And they accumulate over the life cycle of the product. You cannot extract oil and gas without polluting. You cannot process oil and gas without polluting. You cannot burn oil and gas without polluting. It's a whole life cycle. Um, so these seemingly insignificant exposures add up to be very significant in terms of quality of life and length of life. Um, we here in Colorado are in a sacrifice zone. Um, the oil and gas industry is polluting the front range of Colorado, all, the entire state of Colorado, really, uh, but especially here in our non-attainment zone. And they export 90% of the fossil oil, 75% of the fossil methane, out of state, and they export the profits along with that also and leave us with the pollution. So this is simply intolerable. Um, and the um, ECMC cannot ask the industry to regulate themselves. You cannot put the onus on the industry to take care of cumulative impacts just by fiat, just by saying, all right, you guys have to consider it now. Um, they must be regulated. Must be regulated to prevent cumulative impacts. Esos impactos acumulativos a tal grado de... That is your job in the ECMC. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining to us tonight, and thanks for your information. So I, I think um, I don't see any other hands raised, but I want to give folks a chance to do so if they'd like to, and then remind you that's the little raise hand signal. There's Wes again. And then if you don't see the raise hand signal, there's three dots that say more, and then you can raise your hand. Um, so I think I see... Uh, so. Can we have Natasha go next because she hasn't spoken yet? Oops, we just already picked Lucy. That's fine. That's fine. I just want to make sure that Natasha gets a chance to talk too. I oh, did. did we lose Lucy? Yeah, we lost Lucy. Race okay. Day. So can we Natasha's, do Natasha's and then we'll, and then we'll go back to uh, Mr. Wilson? Great. Yeah. Thanks, Roger. There you go. Uh, we can see you, Natasha. Good evening, Commissioner McGowan and Commissioner Cross and others. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a few things, uh, especially in listening to all of the stories that we've heard so far this evening, because I have to admit they were heartbreaking to, to hear. And but I also, you know, really appreciate the opportunity to listen to what people have to say. But I wanted to share, because I don't know if if you know what this looks like, you know, on 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 our side in watching this. In I, I think it's great that it has been set up to be more like a town hall, but 
at least for me, I, I don't really see a town hall experience. I see um, six boxes with six faces with a white cold marble background. <laughs> Um, and then when but somebody, so that was my fault, there was like blue <laughs> or marble. And I was like, let's do marble. And now I'm just, <laughs> head. that is my bad. No, that's okay. It's a very clean background, but I mean, if you can, it, what it feels like is like, you know, the participants of community are not feeling like they're in community, right? Because everybody is, is, um, showing up kind of separate when it's their time to speak. So, and I know it, zoom is not the perfect platform for that, but I just wanted to share that with you because I, I think that's that's also important to kind of see how many people are actually really showing up regarding their their interest um, in this subject. So um, that aside, um, I you know I, I also I, I don't want to repeat what what others have said, but I I really just want, want to encourage the commission to think about how to go about addressing, cumulative impacts. And, and you've heard me say this a, a number of times when I have spoken um, in public comment and also in our written comments, is that we need clear definitions. Um, adverse impacts is not defined in the rules. And so there really needs to be a definition of that so that there can be um, clear and delineated denial criteria. Um, or eligibility criteria, what, however you want to um, look at it, but there needs to be a pathway to saying that this type of development is no longer appropriate in these areas that have been disproportionately impacted. And we know that communities are disproportionately impacted in different ways across the state. The communities in the Front Range are impacted differently than the communities on the Western Slope. Um, you want to look at um, air pollution and air quality issues. You also want to look at um, water issues on the Western Slope and, and climate impact issues. And so where I think we really need to be going is not only a definition of cumulative impacts, but we need to, to go towards some thresholds on basically saying where we've re reached a point where we can't add more burden to those communities. And the other thing that I think is really important is recognizing we don't want to add more burden to disproportionately impacted communities, and we also don't want to create new disproportionately impacted communities. So that that is something um, really important to to think about. And then the other thing I I would just um, add is just the importance of of having more and more conversations with community on a regular basis, much like you do with, with industry, um, because I think that will help in developing some of the tools that the commission needs to be able to do the part of its mission, which is to protect public health, safety, welfare, the environment and, and wildlife. And so I'll leave it at that. I, I wanted to, I want to be brief, but I just wanted to share kind of those key, those key points, which I hope are um, a little practical in getting to that next level of how you go about um, not only evaluating, but also but also addressing um, cumulative impacts. Thank you. Okay, let's go to Kevin next. Kevin? Oh. Bring you up as a panelist. Hello, commissioners. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. I just want to, you know, I, I think that this group has brought up quite a bit of um, some some good points. And I, I, I also agree that denial criteria needs to be a must, especially when we're um, fracking near sensitive neighborhoods and, you know, with the whole um, EPA non attainment, you know, when, when, you know, if we don't meet attainment, that means that, you know, our gasoline prices will also go up because now we would have to use a special blend of gasoline that is less pollutant, um, you know, further exacerbating some of the financial uh, inequities of, you know, these communities. Another point that I would also like to bring up is, you know, fracking near sensitive areas like Superfund sites, right? Like we already know that some of these sites are 
categorized by the EPA as environmentally sensitive. But you know, when when I hear about rocking, you know, the the flats, the um being um you know fracked, and community having to you know show up suddenly because they know that area and they don't feel comfortable with these types of operations going on. I I I think that you know that should automatically be a disqualifier for any other permit that that goes through. Um, you know, we when we were going through droughts and things like that, you know, I we we have to start looking at you know although oil and gas is a commodity, so is our water and our air. And when we start have start having to pay for, you know, w- increased water costs or you know something to clean out the air via the air filters or home whole home air filters, right? That that's a cost to the community. And as someone had mentioned before, you know, exporting all these resources for privatized gains, well, you know, force pooling people to take their minerals at a fraction of the price, you know, that that is just exacerbating more in, inequalities. Um, I, I I cannot speak, you know, to to this, you know, even more, but I, I think it's 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 more, uh, you know, all of this is is about equity and being equitable to everybody in, you know, living in Colorado. Um, we've talked about this many times and having to view these through different lenses. Um, but there I, I don't think that, you know, fracking when we're doing when when it's so unequitable to communities who have you know leaks into murphy creek of existing chemical exposures from superfund sites like i i can't comprehend why we would continue doing that even after it's been designated um and the front range is a prime example 10 years and we're about to you know start missing the next phase of 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 the standard um that we haven't even we haven't even gotten first the the looser the the looser standards so I, I I just think that when we there needs to be clear denial criteria, there needs to be you know equitability. So if someone goes to the hospital, you know it's covered. Um, I'm 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 gonna you know shut up now and let someone else speak because I don't want to go ranting on about like all the injustices and everything. But I'm I'm sure someone you know can say it a lot more, um, um, a lot better than I can. But thank you. I thought you did great. Nice to see you again, Kevin. Commissioner Cross, did you have something you wanted to share? Say before? I did. And, and first off, I just want to say thank you. But I did want to address quickly one point that Natasha brought up, um, and that was the uh, the ability to speak with some of the commissioners um, in the same way that that industry often speaks with us. And and I wanted to comment on that for for two reasons. One of the points that I've tried to bring up in some of our listening sessions as well is that if people have ideas on how we can better communicate with communities, better communicate with disproportionately impacted communities, um, please let us know. Um, as Commissioner McGowan mentioned earlier, our, our information is available on the website. I am always happy to talk to people. I talk to, to members of 350 Colorado. I talk to members of Earth Justice often, um, Wild Earth Guardians and and I'm I'm happy to speak with anybody that can give us better better ideas on how we can better communicate with communities. Um, we've heard some comments over the past couple of weeks about sometimes it can be a lot to have an entire commission in front of people. Um, sometimes, and there's been discussion about notifying people when events are. If if it's easier for us to attend your events, if it's easier to have one commissioner there, multiple commissioners there, please, please provide that feedback. Um, I know I myself am am always interested in knowing how we can improve. um, And I'm sure Commissioner McGowan feel the same way. So please do let us know that. And I am always willing to take one on one meetings as well, um, whether it's with individuals with groups or anybody else. So again, please reach out to us. I'm always happy to discuss. Mr. Wilson. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you, Commissioner Cross. I appreciate that the difficulty that you have is reaching out to especially unorganized groups 
like the general public. Uh, so I wanted to address, uh, Commissioner McCallan, uh, your comment about how you uh, deal with both baseline conditions and past actions. Um, what, Because the two concepts are a little conflated. Uh, baseline conditions would tell you what those past actions are emitting. Uh, and in particular case in Colorado, I think once you, the commission gets into assessing the baseline, you'll see that it's underrepresented by industry reporting, as you just found out from uh, the Colorado Health Department that uh, NOx emissions were underestimated by a factor of 100%. And that you, will, you won't see in the baseline the emissions from um, previously plugged wells. So the baseline is the condition that is there today when all the impacts from past actions are added up. And then you're, you're judging your actions as a program with respect to that baseline or industries judging their actions as a cumulative area development plan against that baseline. And that's one advantage of doing a programmatic. Um, you'll set those conditions so that they don't have to repeat it when an oil and gas development plan comes in. See, that's easier for me to wrap my brain around. So thanks. Mm -hmm. that, that's easier for me to conceptualize. Well, thanks. Thanks for the follow-up. Thank you. I appreciate you asking. Let's uh, hear from Marcia next. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, great. I'm going to echo in on what I just heard about baseline and tag team with Kevin on what he was talking about with the Superfund site. So it's been told to us, um, again, I'm Marsha goldsmith Cameron, and I live in South Shore nearby the Superfund site and the Lowry um, area. And it has been brought to our attention from seismic engineers that we need to perform a baseline study. And that's exactly the same reason as what was just described for cumulative impact, because we will be able to see what all the truck traffic, all the other wells that have already been um, dug and put into place surrounding the area, uh, some of the other waste management sites what they have already contributed to the area. So, so if we do a baseline study before allowing more fracking in the area, we will have an idea what has already occurred around us. And then going forward, we can decide at that point in time whether or not an additional 174 wells will contribute to the seismic activity that can potentially disrupt the landfill that is already been leaking, that is over the aquifers, that provides so many people, disproportionately affected people with the vital source of water. Not only that, but there's a dam that is connected to the reservoir that has a known fault underneath it. What will that seismic activity create in that area? So once again, echoing what I've heard from so many different people and, and having the privilege to be a part of a community who has been trying to voice our concerns along with many, many other communities. We've gotten to know people in Weld County and people in Broomfield County who have shared their stories with us in Boulder County and told us what we can anticipate and expect 
if and when more and more and more wells are approved. So we would like to also say that the local government authority who had ruled on pads prior to new rulemaking have been told that they can't make a change again, even though the industry has made a change in the way in which they're proposing their pad will be expanded. So I, I think when you're talking about cumulative impact, you look at the non-attainment zone, the fact there is already a Superfund site, and if you put all of these things together, that's what we're all asking you to do right now with cumulative impact. And I agree with what others have said tonight as well. We really appreciate this virtual opportunity to participate because it's very difficult uh, after hours to get to all the other locations where the four meetings were being held. So we do appreciate you taking the time and hearing Commissioner Cross say just now that he is willing to come into our communities and meet with us, especially some of our, our environmental justice groups that have been formed because of what is happening in our densely populated area. We would love that opportunity. So thank you again for taking the time to meet with us as a community. Thanks, Marcia. All right, next is Leslie. Uh, thank you for, for this. And again, thank you for taking the time. And even, you know, you gave us extra time, but still, I think you're going to be done at a, at a pretty good time. So really appreciate that. And I wanted to take a minute to thank Oh, now his name doesn't show up, but the interpreter, Mr. Picardo, I, I've checked in a little bit onto the Spanish listening and he's doing a fabulous job and it's really hard to keep doing this for so long. So I uh, just want to really appreciate that and appreciate Commissioner Cross for saying, and I would like to recommend that you actually spend a lot more time in oil and gas country. Not just go for the afternoon, go stand next to the wells, but then see like you get to go home to your homes and you don't know what it's like to sleep all night with the benzene and the toluene and the ethyl benzene and all these things. And then waking up in the morning with your nosebleeds and your headaches and your stomach nausea, y you don't know what that's like. And it, you know, different people develop the sensitivity at different rates. I've talked to a lot of people who have worked on this issue from the scientific point of view. And after they ride around in the van that's doing the testing or they go to the well sites or they make the film, they're like, I'm getting sensitive. And so if a dozen of you were to actually spend significant amount of time, I don't know what the fraction would be, but two or three or four of you would probably start to develop sensitivities. Because you couldn't go home at night and sleep in your own bed and in your own relatively clean air. It's not super clean, but it's a lot cleaner than those that are living right next to or where the wind carries all these pollutants. And I get that that would be hard for you to do, but at the very least, I beg of you to run that thought experiment. If it was me and my kids or me and my grandkids We've heard from the people on the, I've forgotten her name now. She was about third and, you know, her son's just had a baby and it's underweight and they're living right there. And, you know, ask her if you can come just stay with her for a couple of weeks or whatever. And a couple of weeks might not do it, but at least you would get a feel for what it's like to smell this stuff all the time to kind of be like, it's, it's kind of like being in a formaldehyde jar or something all the time. And if you're sensitive, you would really start to understand um, what, what all this talk is about that you're hearing. 
And just think if it was your kids or, or worse, even your grandkids, and they were just starting their lives and they have many years and months and years ahead of them. And then, you know, talk to Mr. Wilson and all the other people in EPA and all the other legal experts that actually understand cumulative impacts and how to measure them, how to deal with them, how to set the baseline, all of those kind of legal questions. But start first with a deep understanding of if this was your kid or your grandkid or yourself, which is no fun, as I explained. But then if it's your kid or your grandkid, then then get real about the rules. So on again, I want to thank you again. Thank all the interpretation and um, just be strong, please be courageous. It's really bad what's happening. So thank you. Okay, Jan is next. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I choose not to be on camera. Um, I am frustrated by my seventh year of engaging in public participation meetings in which all of us are heard and everything we say is ignored when it comes to rulemaking. So I'd like to make some very specific um, suggestions about what you can do in this next rulemaking to uh, acknowledge and respect and address everything you've heard tonight. The first uh, recommendation is you went before the Ozone Interim Committee and you touted the 2000 foot setback from RBUs, residential biz building units. And yet, J Director Murphy produced the 2023 cumulative impacts report that indicated that 35% of approved permits are within 2,000 feet. So stop that. There shall be no more permits within 2,000 feet. Secondarily, the way you get away with 35% of the permits are within 2,000 feet is that you allow something that is not in statutory language and that nobody except you guys in industry ever agreed to, and that's these enormous off-ramps called best management practices and substantially equivalent protections, neither of which are identified in either regulation or statute. So a best management practice, I have listened to these hearings and I have listened to these operators say, well, we want to use a tier four engine, but it may not be available. And so we'll do our best and you approve the permit. And they say, well, we don't have access to electricity right now, but when we do have access, we certainly intend to support solar operations. And you say, permit approved. And you should say, no tier four engine, no approval. Let me know when you got a tier four engine, I'll approve the permit. No electricity, let me know when you run a transformer to your site, I will approve the permit. Substantially equivalent protections is like some sort of ephemera. There is no such thing as I can put a well 750 feet from your house, but I have substantially equivalent protections that make it seem like it's not there at all. That is legitimately, technically impossible. Please change your regulations to get rid of those enormous loopholes that allow thousands of wells that should not exist, according to regulation, from being approved and being drilled in people's neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rips. You. Harmony is uh, next. Hello, everyone. I know many of you and some of you heard this last week in the listening session in, um, in Commerce City. Um, 
I worked in oil and gas for eight years, and I've been to communities all across the country um, and been to scores of fracking sites and got to see the impact firsthand. On the other side of that, it was my job to calculate profits and pay invoices and track inventory. So I saw the huge imbalance on both sides. And I saw who made the money and who continued to pay the price. And I will always think about sitting in a board meeting where we said, should we write a one of those big promotional $25,000 checks to the food bank or to the fire department? And which one would get us better PR? And the answer was, well, the food bank, because it's one of the most used in the state. And then I think, well, if oil and gas has been so great for this community, why does it have one of the most used food banks in the state? And then at the same time, I'm calculating profits for um, oil and gas midstream market traders for two to $3 million a month. I don't make two to $3 million a month, do you? <laughs> and so, and then also, but paying the railroads, the producers, the water services, the trucking companies, the pipelines, the utility commissioner, the commission, utility commissions, the refineries, everyone is making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of the lungs and lives of communities of color and the poor, but now more well-off communities in Aurora and all around us. Um, when I think about cumulative impacts, I think of totals. What I find missing in a lot of these conversations is, what is the total of water that has been used by oil and gas last year? Total, not just on 4 GDPs, but all of it. What is the total emissions for everything in the environment? We already know that OGDPs um, really range greatly with their estimates and accuracy. Well, I don't know if we actually know that because I don't know if we actually track the difference between, actually, I believe we don't, between what an OGDP says and what the completion form says that again is problematic because it's self-reported. But at the very least in the cumulative impacts reports, I would like to see totals, total water injected into the ground, total water used, total emissions going to the sky, total percentage of land use, but the other side of that total I would like to see is how much money oil and gas is making. How many spill, I guess there's kind of that, the spills and the incidents, the ones that are caught and the ones that are reported. But I think it's really important to put up there that in 2022, oil and gas made $25 billion in revenue in the state of Colorado alone. And that's an ECMC number. I also wanna see the taxes paid in each community because that's what we always say, the benefits. I wanna maybe see numbers on jobs. So we can say, well, does this make sense? I also wanna know the total amount of oil and gas that leaves this state because we forever impact our air, our water and our land for a majority of project product that leaves this state that makes certain groups and people millions and billions of dollars. While we have children with bloody noses asthma and people that are dying. People are literally dying. And I feel like that doesn't matter in this world. I look around this world every day and I don't feel like anybody cares about a lot of things. I like to hope that you all care. You're here today. I actually, I have been quite impressed with some of the comments, the feedback and the thoughtfulness that have come out of this. And I have hope. What I hate about having hope is that I'm continually crushed and disappointed time and time again. But I'm coming out here with hope in this commission, hope in this process. And one of the things that I'm looking at my rambling notes all over the place is I wanna see alternatives, but I don't wanna see an alternative location. What I wanna see is an alternative way of thinking because our world is burning down and it's burning down fast. And so what if instead of building all these fracking sites around the Aurora Reservoir, we put in agrivoltaics we rematriarched and we regenerated the soil. We had better usage of water and we created local energy sources that are renewable as well as local food sources. I know it sounds crazy, but imagine a world where we had reliable, renewable, clean energy and food sources as future pandemics are coming on and climate catastrophes. What a great place that would be in Colorado instead of continue to extract the land, pollute the air, take the water to the point of extinction that we can never get back for our future generations. Thank you.
Thank you, Harmony. I, um, Roger, I don't think I see any other hands raised, but I do want to make sure that everyone who's wanted to speak has had a chance. I don't see any raised hands. Okay. So I'll I'll try to bring it all home and then Commissioner Cross, if you have anything to add or if anyone else has anything to add, let me know. Again, really appreciative for everyone's time tonight. I know this is a busy time of year for everybody. I acknowledge that this has been short notice and thank you for your space and grace for that. Um, thank you also to our interpreters tonight. I was really curious to know if this was going to work and I think it worked pretty well and I, I'm watching them work really hard and I want to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who spent two hours with us tonight. Um, I heard a lot of ideas that we've also heard in our in-person community meetings during our informal written and public um, docket and also earlier this year uh, for the listening sessions. So I think there's some good thing themes for Commissioner Cross and I to share with the commission before the draft rules um, get uh, finalized and uh, shared with commissioners for consideration. Um, again, we're both Commissioner Cross and I have our information on the website if you would like to reach out to us. And I just want to really say thank you. And then for those of you who are heading off into hopefully some time off and time with your family, I hope it is um, time well spent and ref uh, you get some time to refresh because we are definitely going to keep doing this in the new year. So thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Cross, do you want to add anything? I'll just reiterate my appreciation for everyone taking the time in their busy schedules to speak with us, both um, as Commissioner McGowan said, during some of our previous hearings on this, as well as in some of our in-person listening sessions and again tonight. Um, so thank you and and rest assured, we we are taking note of what is being said and um, and we look forward to continuing to work with everyone on. Okay, with that, I'm gonna wish everyone a great evening and thank you so much for being here tonight. <laughs>